Hi, welcome back to this uh, lecture series on ethics. This is the seventh lecture and this lecture will focus on the following topics. So, in the previous lecture we discussed the Euthyphro dilemma which basically raises certain doubts about the validity, the very validity of uh, uh, the divine command theory as an ethical theory, as a sound ethical theory. And uh, this uh, lecture will uh, elaborate upon this, particularly the Euthyphro dilemma which is uh, discussed in Plato's dialogue. And here uh, we are going to highlight uh, some problems. There is this independence problem which is the first issue which could arise from the kind of challenge Euthyphro's uh, dilemma is raising. Socrates raises this problem or rather this is implicit in Socratic uh, dialogue. Then the arbitrariness problem the emptiness problem and the problem of aberrant comments. So, these are the topics which we are going to roughly cover in this lecture and also uh, a little bit in the next lecture. So, we will uh, come to the Euthyphro dilemma which uh, I have already discussed in the previous lecture, but I will just uh, try to brush up. So, it says that if divine command theory is true then either one the first possibility morally good acts are willed by God because they are morally good as uh, I have already discussed this in the previous lecture that uh, they are already morally good. So, their moral goodness has been recognized by God and pronounces God pronounces it. So, that is the role of God. So, they are not made good by God, but they are already morally good. Now, the question is then who made them good? Why are they good? That is uh, that is a problem here. The second uh, possibility is morally good acts are morally good because they are willed by God. So, this possibility suggests that they become good because God wills them. So, it is God's will which makes them good. So, that is the second possibility. So, uh, the Euthyphro dilemma actually raises, puts us in the middle of these two kind of uh, possibilities and tells us that these are one of these things have to be true. Uh, there is no third possibility. These two options are logically exhaustive. If one is true, the other one cannot be true and vice versa. So, this is the problem. And it says that morally good acts are willed by God because they are morally good, then they are morally good independent of God's will. So, this is the issue. So, if you take the first possibility, if morally good acts are willed by God because they are already morally good, then what is morally good is independent of God's will. So, God has nothing to do there, God just only recognizes that and pronounces it. Then what is God's role? God seems to be merely telling us that, okay, this is what is morally good. But then the question who made them good or why are they good is never answered. God cannot say that I have made it good because uh, they are already morally good. Then why do we consider them as morally good? That question is never been answered if you adopt this position. The independence problem, moral facts are held independent of God's will and divine command theory cannot accept it because divine command theory in a very important sense asserts that what is good depends on God's will or rather God plays a very important role in deciding what is good and what is right and making this distinction between good and evil and right and wrong. But if you accept this possibility, this possibility then it denies any significant role to God at all. So, that is something which the divine command theory cannot accept. According to divine command theory, all of morality is dependent upon God, it should be dependent upon God. So, that is the problem here and therefore, the divine command theorists cannot answer the Euthyphro dilemma in this way. Now, let us go to the other possibilities. Morally good acts are morally good because they are willed by God, then there is no reason either to care about God's moral goodness or to worship Him. So, here there are a set of problems which we could see that uh, emanates from this possibility. The possibility merely tells us that something becomes good because God had willed so. It is God's will that makes it good. So, there is the arbitrariness of problem, there is the emptiness problem and there is a problem of aberrant commands which is a very serious problem. So, we will try to see uh, these three issues. So, first the arbitrariness problem. Here morally good depends on what God wills and then how does God decide what to command? This is a very important question for which uh, they do not have a very clear answer. 
it says that what factors inform his decision to decide that certain acts say for example, charity is good or certain other acts stealing is bad or rape is bad. How can we uh, decide so? If God is the one who made rape bad and charity good, what factors really made God to decide so or led God to decide so? So, for which for this question there is no answer. Morality depends on God's decision. So, there is apparently no factor that seems to be deciding or rather leading God's to decide in a certain way, which means that it is quite arbitrary which does not depend on what is moral and what is immoral. So, God's decision or God's will seem to have nothing to do with what is moral and what is immoral. They are moral or immoral because God decided so and so which means that morality becomes quite arbitrary to the will of God. Then again there cannot be moral facts before God makes a decision that is again another interesting a consequence of this position there are no moral facts before God made something good or bad and no such facts can influence God decision because God is absolutely independent absolute he is an absolute. So, his decision cannot be influenced by anything else then his decision is morally arbitrary. So, this is the conclusion one can arrive at if one follows this path again therefore, whatever decision God makes is just as good as any other. So, from a moral perspective from a purely from the perspective of morality one can argue that whatever decision God makes just as good as any other decision because there is nothing good or bad before God really made a decision. No moral reasons seem to be guiding God and God could have commanded anything the entire morality which we talk about quite arbitrary because God could have decided rape as good. He did not do that, but that is a different thing why he did not do that is a question. So, there is no answer to that question he just did not do that since he did not do that since he made rape bad rape is bad, but what about if he had made it good then it would have become good. So, it becomes quite arbitrary God whim makes something good. So, it is mere a whim of God that some a particular set of actions are bad and a particular set of actions are good and his standard is quite arbitrary we have no way to know what his standard is and this makes morality itself arbitrary. Now, let us come to the next issue the emptiness problem. The emptiness problem is again which is related to the arbitrariness problem it says that statements such as God is good, God's commands are good and God's actions are good are trivial. Why are they trivial? Because it basically tells you that moral statements or morality is empty when you really try to understand the reason behind why a certain kind of an action is good or bad you do not find anything. So, there is no meaning in it. So, it ultimately points to the fact that it is good because God is good, but the very statement God is good or God commands are good or God's actions are good are trivial because they are true, but have no content. God's will is a standard of moral goodness. So, there is nothing which makes a particular action of God a particular will of God good. See for instance, in, in our case in our ordinary human beings case when I do something when I decide to do something one can criticize me by saying that it is morally wrong to do so. So, which means that my standard is wrong my standard does not match or rather it violates say for instance in the language of a divine command theorist it violates God decision what God has prescribed yes. So, in that way my actions would become either good or bad, but here when it comes to when you take the question to the next level when you try to understand God's action or God decision from this perspective what happens it takes you to a kind of an empty wall. They are true because they have no content. God's will is the standard of moral goodness, God is good is to say that God is as he wills himself to be, God is good because God is as he wills himself to be. So, it is not that something makes some criteria is there to evaluate God's 
character or God's decision as good or bad. To say that God's commands are good would be to say that God commands what he wants to command. The question again, why are God's commands good is never answered, it cannot be answered. If you ask the same question about a human beings, a normal human beings actions, we can always say that that is because it complies with the standards prescribed by God or by the scriptures. But when you ask the question to God, what makes God's commands good? There is no answer, it just say that God commands what he wants to command and what he wants to command is good. There is no reason to raise any question about it, which makes the entire statement empty. Now, this is a little more serious problem, the problem of aberrant commands. It says that even morally aberrant acts such as rape, murder and genocide could possibly be morally true. This is what I pointed out in, in the beginning of this lecture, when I mentioned about the problem of aberrant commands, because it basically tells you that these actions like uh, murder, rape and genocide, which normally we consider as wrong, morally wrong. Are, uh, why do we consider them as morally wrong? So, here if you very strictly follow the dictates of divine command theory, we could uh, reach to this conclusion that there is nothing, but only because God will so. So, even morally aberrant acts such as these acts could possibly be morally good if God had willed them so. God could possibly command rape, murder and genocide and possibly could say that they are good actions, but God did not do that, that is a different thing, but he could have done that. Okay, there is nothing which prevents God from doing that, because there is nothing which is virtually impossible to God, God could do anything. So, God can make aberrant act, I mean the morally objectionable and wrong actions good. So, his arbitrary choice made them wrong, nothing else, but mere arbitrary choice. And an omnipotent God can very well issue such commands that which makes that these actions are also good. Therefore, it is possible for such acts to be morally laudable. So, this is the kind of situation which uh, Euthyphro dilemma is trying to expose. Some of the inherent difficulties which uh, a divine command theorist would uh, encounter ultimately when he goes, when he pursues his theory. Now, uh, before we getting into the details of this, because I, I think I am, I can wind up my discussion on divine command theory here and uh, some issues will uh, figure in later also, some aspects of this theory might figure in later also, when we take up uh, other theoretical frameworks for discussion. Because now what I am going to do is that, I will have a very brief discussion of Christian ethics here, in a very brief in the sense that I am not going to the details of uh, what is uh, Christian ethics but we will try to give a very basic understanding of what Christian ethics means based on the belief system propagated by the Bible and also how historically Christianity had evolved in Europe. So, and this is very interesting because uh, we have just discussed divine command theory, which is a very strong theory suggested by some of the Christian theorist moralist. It is not just Christian moralist alone who propagate divine command theory, many other religious frameworks do that, but there are a certain set of Islamic propagators who also subscribe to a form of uh, divine command theory. But then it will be very interesting for us to and relevant for us to examine the evolution of ethics during a certain point in history. This is uh, where Christianity has evolved its own unique moral perspectives based on certain fundamental principles. The reason is that now the other two important theoretical frameworks which we are going to discuss. One is the deontological theories, where the chief proponent of uh, this theory is Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher, who emphasizes on the aspect of duty, which is again a derivative of uh, a broad Christian worldview. We will see that. Then again, there are other sets of moral theories, which can be called as teleological theories. Teleological theories suggest that there is teleology means there is a sort of a purpose. So, there is a purpose behind your action, there is a purpose for being good. What is that purpose? The attainment of good, the achievement of good and uh, the concept of good can vary from perspective to perspective. 
say for example, for some people it is self-realization, for some people it is to go to heaven, paradise and all that, but there is a concept of good which is considered as a summum bonum by some of these uh, theoretical frameworks. They are called the teleological theories, even Aristotle's eudaimonism is a teleological framework. So, we will see all these things how they culminate and how they actually flow to the development of Christian ethics and then how certain other frameworks emanate from this broader framework. So, in one sense this is a very interesting juncture in the history of ethics. Before we get into the details, we will just see the fundamental aspects of Christian ethics. So, here there is no doubt God's commands are very important. So, what God does is God commands us to obey him as he knows what is best for us. God has commanded, there is a categorical command from God, what to do. In one sense we can say that this is the essence of uh, the Judaic tradition, the Moses for example, the Mosaic law, the very concept of law which is uh, advocated by the Abrahamic tradition, very strongly by the Jewish tradition and also to some extent by the Christian tradition and Islamic traditions. We can see that there is a concept of a very strong command by God and this command by God becomes law. This concept of law which the Abrahamic tradition propagates cannot be uh, distinguished from natural law or in other words we can say that the idea of law encompasses both moral laws as well as natural laws. There is a kind of identification of these two, we will see that. So, we fail to obey God, then we fail to do what is good for us, because what is good for us is non better to God than us. So, this is an implicit suggestion. So, for our own good we have to obey God. So, it is a teleological conception, because it tells you that why certain things have to be done, why God's commands have to be followed, there is a reason for that, there is an objective for that and that objective is our own good, the attainment of our own good and then it is a form of egocentrism. We can say that of course, in that sense the Christian ethics is a kind of egocentric ethics, but in that sense Aristotelian, Socratic, Platonic ethics they are also egocentric. Indian ethics by and large is egocentric, because they all talk about the ultimate objective of life is some sort of self realization, which is understood in terms of uh, moksha in the Brahmanical tradition and uh, nirvana in uh, Buddhist tradition, kaivalya in certain other traditions and uh, all that. So, most of them are egocentric, what we need to keep in mind is that egocentric needs to be distinguished from self centric in the sense in which we understand self centeredness or selfish in today's vocabulary. Now, we have to find certain reasons for obeying God. Obedience to God and God's command as a law play very key role in the very idea of formulating Christian ethics. We need to really arrive at or try to find out some reasons for obeying God. And these three can be identified as uh, some reasons, strong reasons, God is holy, God is good, God is powerful. We need to obey God because he is holy, he is pious. We need to obey God because he is good, he is the absolute good and he knows what is good. And we need to obey God because he is powerful and in case if we violate his laws or his commands it will attract punishment. So, in that sense he is quite powerful. So, these three actually they are they look interconnected, of course they are interconnected, but at the same time emphasizing on one of these over the other implies a certain other kind of a perspective. So, there are certain important distinctions between these three perspectives. Now, to obey God have to surrender to him. What do you mean by obeying God? You have to be literally a slave of God, completely surrender yourself in front of him and in a sense you know what you need to attain is a certain kind of identification of your will with God's will. It is a complete egolessness, one loses oneself completely and surrenders oneself to the almighty 
and then does only those things which the Almighty wants, wants to do, not just doing, even in your thoughts, actions and deeds and words. Everywhere you have to be a complete slave of God and the more you surrendered to God, the best kind of morally person you are. So, this is the suggestion which we get from this perspective. Have to have total faith in him, absolute faith. There should not be even a trace of doubt about his holiness, about his power and about his omnipotence. We are finite and God is non-finite because everything in this world is finite. We know that every object in this world is finite. And since uh, there are degrees of finiteness, we could see that you know something is lesser finite than something else or rather more finite than something else. So, if you extend this into a scale, then it ultimately takes us to a region where you will find something which is not finite and that concept, that possibility of a non-finite existence is what God represents. So, we are actually uh, the very logical possibility that is suggested by our finite nature that our reason, our rational faculty recognizing ourselves as finite creatures, this recognition also points to the possibility that there is an infinite creature which is more powerful and holier than all of us. And now, when you come to the power of God, God is omniscient and knows everything. Something which is omniscient should be knowing everything and he knows what is good better than anyone else. So, what is good for you is known to God better than you yourself know about it. Hence, what is good for you? Just surrender, just obey him. Do not have any ego or agency independent of God's will. So, surrender yourself absolutely conditionless to God's will. He made all possibilities available and their consequences. Why certain actions have certain consequences? Because God made so, certain actions have certain consequences are decided by God. So, every decision is made by God and he tells us what to do. Disobedience attracts punishment because he is absolutely powerful. He is omniscient, omnipotent and absolutely powerful. And then is the motive for punishing the good is our self-interest. So, motive for pursuing the good. Now, that is what morality is all about. Ethics is all about telling you that why one should pursue good. So, here one can critically see that the motive for pursuing the good is a kind of a self-interest because it is basically for our own interest. What is good for us is better known to God. So, better obey him. Why to obey him? Because we have to be in the path of good and we have to attain the good. It is for my good I do that, not that I want to help someone else. See, I am doing charity not for the sake of helping that person who is in great danger or uh, I am a person who is uh, supporting the human beings who are suffering in this world, not because I am compassionate about them, not because I am loving them, not because I have a real concern about their sufferings, but because if I help them and try to help them to come out of their suffering, that will ultimately help me to attain my good. So, it is not their welfare or their happiness or their well-being that matters to me. It is my well-being. So, in that sense we can argue that it is quite egocentric. And uh, then again this whole ideas about disobedience and punishment are also there, they are quite tricky here. Because it says that the motive for pursuing the good is our self-interest. It would on the one hand help us to avoid punishment and on the other hand gain certain benefits. This is from McIntyre's uh, History of Ethics. He says that then religious morality becomes self-defeating. This is the situation which we are encountering that uh, disobedience and punishment are attached to that and also rewards attached to that to obedience. Then um, the motive for uh, pursuing good or uh, motive for avoiding wrong actions seem to be nothing but self-interest. But then what McIntyre argues is that this makes the whole idea of morality self-defeated. It says that then religious morality becomes self-defeating at least insofar as it was originally designed to condemn pure self-interest. The very idea behind religious morality is to condemn self 
self-interest to overcome it. So, all your attempts to overcome self-interest ultimately seem to be asserting it quite strongly. This view of the role of uh, the concept of the power of God may suggest that religious conceptions of morality are intelligible only insofar as they complement or otherwise elaborate upon existing secular conception. So, this is a very interesting position which uh, McIntyre takes us to consider or rather uh, invites us to consider. He says that this view of uh, the role of the concept of power of God may suggest that religious conceptions of morality are intelligible, they become sensible only insofar as they complement or otherwise elaborate upon existing secular conceptions. So, every society will have certain conceptions of morality, particularly in today's world which is largely secular because uh, most of our democracies believe in kind of a secular uh, models of uh, morality which is slightly independent of what we have inherited from our religious traditions. Of course, that does not mean that the so called uh, morality which we practice or which we consider as good and uh, distinguish from bad is uh, completely independent and free from religious assumptions, not in that way, but there is a kind of broad secular perspective about morality. So, in one sense the legitimacy of uh, the religious morality depends on how they complement this secular conceptions. This is what uh, McIntyre calls the paradox of uh, Christian ethics. So, he says that it is always tried to devise a code for society as a whole from uh, pronouncements which were addressed to individuals or small communities to separate themselves off from the rest of the society. So, this happens for example, the Judaic morality it was originally designed devised for the Jews for a particular community of people group of people a society of people and uh, now Christianity has to really proclaim its universal validity. Christianity makes its universal validity or rather the very basis of Christian morality is that it is applicable to everyone not just to a group of people or a community of uh, people or so. McIntyre again says that Jesus is not expounding a self sufficient code, but to provide a corrective for the parasitic morality. This is what it is a kind of a it appears or Jesus pronouncements appear as a kind of a correction to the existing moral framework of the pharaohs. And we cannot therefore, expect to find in what they say a basis for life in a continuing society in the even in the present day. So, hence Christianity's moral concepts are derived from other conceptual frameworks. So, it has to rather base itself on certain other things. The pure I mean if you really go back to Bible and the history of Christianity you will end up with this paradox. So, you have to overcome that what do you do? I mean what uh, McIntyre says is that Christianity's moral concepts are in that way derived from other conceptual frameworks and they are borrowing from feudal social life of concepts of hierarchy and role that was the existing social system during those days. So, he says that in order to provide norms Christianity has to be expressed in feudal terms thereby it deprives itself of every opportunity for criticizing feudal social relations. So, this is a kind of a criticism which uh, he raises and then again medieval God is always a compromise between the commanding voice of Jehovah upon Sinai and the God of the philosophers either Plato or Aristotle. So, that is the other stream of influence the philosophers Plato and Aristotle. So, these are the two moral conceptions of Christianity or rather these are the two sources from where they develop it. The first one is teleological the idea of an ultimate good guiding all actions which is derived from the Greeks and deontological the idea of a divine law that is universally binding. I will elaborate upon these two distinctions in the next lecture for the time being we will wind up this lecture. Thank you.